Hello, my name is Philippe Girard, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. And I'm Yennefer Flores, a history student at McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was the longest serving British Prime Minister of the 20th century. A hero to some and a villain to others. And one tough cookie. Her name was the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. Along the way, we will sample some classic rock and pop from the 1970s and 80s in Britain. Great stuff, in it. <laughs> sure is. I had a hard time cutting it down to five or six songs. We'll start with the best-selling British artist of the period, Elton John, and one of his early hits, Crocodile Rock from 1973. Bonjour and welcome back to Your Grandma Rocks. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Jennifer Flores. This was Crocodile Rock by Elton John. Today we are exploring the life of the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. She was born Margaret Roberts in 1925 in Granham, Lincolnshire. Her background was solidly middle class. Her dad owned two grocery shops in town and he served as town mayor for a while. Also of note, her dad was a Methodist preacher who taught her Protestant values such as personal responsibility and hard work. Here's another interesting fact. 
In 1938, when she was just 12, she used her allowance money to help a Jewish girl escape from Nazi Germany. The girl lived with Margaret Thatcher's family for a while. So personal responsibility, hard work, and how to do the right thing. That was a great education. She later attended Oxford University. What did she study? Political science? Economics? Strangely, neither. She got a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. She worked under Dorothy Hodgkin, who later earned the Nobel Prize. Maybe we could do a show about her too? We've already had shows about Marie Curie, the first woman to get a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and Lisa Meitner, who should have earned a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, but didn't. So Dorothy Hodgkin is definitely on my list. After graduating, she worked as a research chemist for a plastics manufacturer for a while. She then applied for another job, but she was rejected because, according to the human resources representative, she was headstrong, obstinate, and dangerously self-opinionated. That seemed like a pretty fair assessment of the Iron Lady. But also a good example of how men with strong personalities are celebrated as decisive, while women who do the same are criticized as overbearing. She did face some sexist pushback. When she was a student, the Oxford Union Debating Society refused to let her in because they only accepted male members. So she joined the university's conservative association instead and made a name for herself as a tough debater. She had been drawn to politics from her youngest age when she had followed her dad's career in local city government. Politics was in my bloodstream, she later said. In 1950 and 1951, she twice ran for parliament, which was pretty daring on her part. She was still in her 20s, and she ran in a very liberal district at a time when the Labour Party was dominant. The aftermath of World War II was a time when Britain created the welfare state, set up universal health care, and nationalized many industries. There was a national consensus on the matter, including for many conservatives. Predictably, she lost both elections, but she did much better than expected and people took note. Some observers even began to look at her as a potential prime minister one day, even though she was still in her 20s and there had never been a female prime minister in Britain before. 1951 was also the year when she met Dennis Thatcher, a wealthy businessman who became her husband and lifelong partner. Soon thereafter, she gave birth to twins. Oh, and she also studied the law and passed her bar exam. Needless to say, she was a bit busy during those years and had to put her political aspirations on hold for a time. Time for a musical break? Indeed. We'll listen to Roxanne by the police. Wait, Margaret Thatcher is a young married mom, and you pick a song about a prostitute? Don't read too much into my choice. I just love that song, that's all.
Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Flores, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks, the women's history show on KBYS. Et je suis Philippe Girin. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, Margaret Thatcher. Before our break, we had followed her early and successful forays into politics in the early 1950s. The Labour and Conservative parties both favored the welfare state at the time, so her message of self-reliance was not in keeping with the times. Things began to change in 1959 when she ran again for Parliament, this time successfully. As a member of Parliament, or MP as they call it in England, she became known for her advocacy of free market solutions. She was inspired by the works of Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek, who are two of the main prophets in the modern conservative movement. Milton Friedman was an economist who argued for strict monetary policies designed to limit public spending and curb inflation. This was in direct contrast with the policies advocated by British economist John Maynard Keynes. Friedrich Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom, in which he warned that government control of the economy eventually led to tyranny. So she was a liberal in the British sense of the term, an advocate of liberty both in the marketplace and for civil liberties. This belief in personal freedom led her to embrace causes that would be anathema to American social conservatives today. As a member of parliament, she supported the legalization of abortion and the decriminalization of male homosexuality. Her determination and strong beliefs helped her go up through the ranks of the Conservative Party. And when the party won the 1970s election, she was picked as Secretary of State for Education. That was a sobering experience for her. In an effort to cut costs, she stopped providing free milk to school children. The public howled about it, and the tabloids, which are pretty brutal in Britain, nicknamed her Satcher the Milk Snatcher. She was so distraught by the episode that she thought of giving up politics after all. She was also convinced that she would never be more than a second fiddle in the Conservative Party. Quote, there will not be a woman prime minister in my lifetime, she said. The male population is just too prejudiced. And yet, somehow, she beat the odds, literally. In 1975, she challenged the outgoing prime minister for the position of Conservative Party leader. It was such a ridiculous notion that the bookmakers put the odds against her at 50 to 1. And yet, she won. It doesn't mean that everything was easy for her from then on. The Conservative Party, as the name implies, was attached to a very traditional vision of womanhood. Leaders of the party traditionally joined the elite Carlton Club, but she was denied admission because the club wouldn't accept women, not even when they were the leader of Britain's Conservative Party. Britain was definitely a society in transition in the 1970s. The Labour Party came back in power in 1974 and faced major difficulties. Some were temporary, like the oil embargo in the Middle East, but there was a more general sense that Britain no longer was a world power and that the country was in decline. The kind of dystopian England portrayed in Clockwork Orange. Exactly. Both the book and the movie. In 1978, strikes broke out all over England in so-called winter of discontent. Things got so bad that the foreign minister warned of a breakdown of the democracy and said, quote, If I were a young man, I would emigrate. Wow. You know things are bad when your own government is advising you to give up and leave the country. Exactly. With all that gloom and doom, the electorate was willing to try something completely different and give Margaret Thatcher a majority in the 1979 parliamentary election. And that's how she became prime minister. From MP to PM. Before we get to her career in office, let's pause and sample some of the music that is emblematic of the British crisis of the 1970s. You mean punk rock? Yes, specifically the Sex Pistols' Anarchy in the UK. <laughs> Bye, cause I 
And welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. This was Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. Je suis Philippe Girard. And I'm Yennefer Flores. Today we're covering the life of Margaret Thatcher, elected as the first female prime minister in British history in 1979. Or, as she's better known, the Iron Lady. She got that nickname from a Soviet journalist. It was not meant as a compliment, but she came to embrace it. She definitely fit the label. In 1981, prisoners from the Irish Republican Army went on a hunger strike to obtain the status of political prisoner. The response was simple. She refused to budge. Ten prisoners died from hunger, and then the strike ended. But economics was really the main issue on her agenda. When she came to office, the situation in Britain was dire. High inflation, high unemployment, and a general sense of national decline. Her recipe was simple. Reduce the size of government, cut taxes, reward success, and empower people to make their own decisions. In other words, take the whole welfare state created over the previous 40 years and toss it out the window. Some of these measures were controversial, but she was not the kind of person to back down from an unpopular decision if she thought she was right. Quote, I am not a consensus politician, she said. I am a conviction politician. I came to office with one deliberate intent, she said, to change Britain from a dependent to a self-reliant society, from a give-it-to-me to a do-it-yourself nation. Her policies were decisive but also hurtful in the short run. She refused to subsidize public businesses that were losing money and instead privatize them or let them go bankrupt. She also cut down income taxes while raising the sales tax to make up the difference, which had the effect of hurting the poor. Then she tackled inflation, which meant raising interest rates through the roof, even if that led to mass unemployment. The pain was real. By 1981, interest rates were at 22% and the unemployment rate was the highest since the Great Depression. To her, this was the price to pay to wean Britain off government spending and inflation. Things will get worse before they get better, she said. Members of her party were convinced that she was going to lose the next election. But then something unexpected had happened. In April 1982, Argentina invaded the Falklands Island. These are also known as the Malouinas in Argentina. The military junta there was convinced that the islands were theirs by right. As such, the Falklands are just some windswept rainy islands in the South Atlantic. As opposed to the UK, a bunch of windswept rainy islands in the North Atlantic. Right. But she was also a nationalist who refused to let a former world power like Britain yield to some two-bit dictators. So she sent a naval task force that reconquered the islands for Britain. That was a major shot in the arm for the country. For once, Britain was winning again. The 1982 Falkland War also provided an interesting backdrop to the 1986 World Cup, where amazingly, Britain and Argentina happened to face off in the quarterfinals. Who won? Argentina got their revenge with two winning goals by Diego Maradona. One was the most beautiful goal ever scored in the World Cup. Maradona started in his own half and then dribbled past the entire English team before scoring. The second goal was the most controversial goal in World Cup history. He scored it with his hand, but the referee didn't notice, and that was enough to kick Britain out of the World Cup. At least the British won where it mattered, on the battlefield. I don't know. Many would say that a spot in the World Cup finals is far more important than the Falkland Islands. But anyway, the economy also began to show signs of progress in 1982, which helped revive Margaret Thatcher's popularity. The Labour Party didn't help their cause when they doubled down on their agenda of nationalization and government intervention. In 1983, 
Thatcher won the election again and began a second term as prime minister. When you think of how unpopular she was just two years earlier, it was a real miracle. A miracle indeed. Let's listen to Boy George now. This was It's a Miracle by Boy George. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I'm Jennifer Flores. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. Today we are retracing the life of Margaret Thatcher, re-elected to a second term as Prime Minister in 1983. She began her second term as a popular figure, having just won the Falkland War over Argentina. Then, in 1984, her enemies from the Irish Republican Army put a bomb in a hotel where she was staying. Five people were killed, but she survived and insisted on delivering her speech as planned. That show of resolve only made her more popular. At least with some sectors of the electorate. Her tough economic policies meant that she was still very controversial. In 1984, her government decided to close dozens of coal mines and fire the workers. The unions fought back with a national strike. Again, she refused to back down. She declared the strike illegal and held her ground until the unions gave up. All mines in England were eventually closed down or privatized. Her tenure in office essentially destroyed union power in Britain. The number of workdays lost to strikes went down from 29 million in 1979 to 2 million in 1990 when she left office. Aside from coal mines, she privatized many businesses that had been taken over by the government after World War II. She only refused to privatize the railroads and the National Health Service, which are popular public institutions in Britain. She sold off the shares of the privatized companies to the public at a discount to encourage British people to become stockholders. She also sold off a lot of public housing units to encourage home ownership. These measures gave British people more stake in their economy, while also securing London's place as the largest financial institution in Britain, and to some extent the world, to the present time. 
On the other hand, her critics complained that she was creating a less egalitarian Britain where the rich made a lot of money and the poor lost their safety net. Still, she was elected for third term in 1987, remaining as polarizing as ever. Yes, Margaret Thatcher evoked extreme feelings. To some, she could do no right, to others, no wrong. Indifference was not an option. Her reputation among academics remains touch and go. Well, academics are usually liberal and they are public servants. So a conservative politician who is committed to slashing the budget of public universities will always be a tough sell. Even feminist scholars were ambivalent about her. Sure, she was the most successful female British politician in the 20th century. Male or female, actually. No prime minister served longer than she did. Right. But she refused to embrace the feminist agenda. But the issue that really caused her downfall had nothing to do with opposition within academia. No, in 1989, she proposed to change the way local taxes were paid. Instead of paying a tax based on the value of one's house, everyone, rich or poor, would pay the same amount. It was known as the poll tax. This regressive form of taxation led to massive protests all over England in 1990. She didn't care. She insisted on doing what she thought was right and paid no attention to the polls. But other members of her party did pay attention to the polls, and they were afraid that they would be routed at the next election if they proceeded with the poll tax. So in 1990, a rival challenged Margaret Thatcher in the Conservative Party. Thatcher felt so betrayed that she resigned from the Prime Minister's office in 1990. Thus ended a long and tumultuous career in government. Before we cover the end of her life, let's continue our exploration of 1980s British music. There are too many great singers to cover, so we'll kill two birds with one stone. Here is the song Under Pressure by Queen, but featuring David Bowie. <laughs> Bienvenue à tous. This was Under Pressure by Queen with David Bowie. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Jennifer Flores. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. Today we retrace the life of Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of England from 1979 until 1990. She remained as a deputy in the House of Commons and then she was named a Baroness, which allowed her to sit in the House of Lords. She continued to give speeches and such, but never exercised the immense power that she wielded in the 1980s. Still, her influence was tremendous. From the 1940s until the 1970s, British politicians from the right and the left had extended the economic reach of government and financed the welfare state. She completely changed the paradigm, even within the Labour Party. The 1990s saw the rise of Tony Blair, who incorporated many of the free market policies introduced by Margaret Thatcher. In 2007, she became the first living Prime Minister to be honored by a statue in the House of Commons. She would have liked it to be made of iron, of course, but it was bronze. She quipped, at least it won't rust. That was one of her last public appearances. 
but then she was suffering from dementia and struggled to keep her facts straight. She died of a stroke in 2013 at the age of 87. Her obituary in the New York Times said it all. Even some of her strongest critics according her a grudging respect. What a life. We're glad we could share it with you. Quelle vie incroyable en effet. Merci et au revoir. Thank you and goodbye.